Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now, as you may have heard, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, the Nobel Peace Prize winner who helped end apartheid in South Africa, has died aged 90. The Nelson Mandela Foundation said <coughs> Archbishop Tutu was an extraordinary human being who was a thinker, a leader, and a shepherd. A seven-day send-off is being organized for the Nobel laureate. The plans include a requiem mass and two days lying in state to allow the public to pay their respects. Tributes have been pouring in. President Biden said he was heartbroken by his death. And former President Barack Obama said Desmond Tutu had always been willing to find humanity in his adversaries. Queen Elizabeth said she was deeply saddened by the death of a man she called a tireless champion for human rights in South Africa and worldwide. Well, to help us assess the impact of Desmond Tutu and the impact he had on South Africa and across the continent and beyond, I'm joined now in the studio by Ambassador Humphrey Ojiako, Nigeria's former permanent representative at the United Nations, and on the line by the international journalist and African affairs analyst, uh, Lindsay Barrett. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> uh, there you are, Lindsay. I was looking across to see if you were there but, but you are behind me thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us and let me come to you first Lindsay um, you met Desmond Tutu to some extent it could be said that you knew him what are your reflections about his life well Charles I don't need to tell you that one of the very wonderful rewards of this job of ours especially as an independent uh, journalist, is that you meet the good, the great, the notorious. You meet, the one, you meet wonderful people all the time. One of the most wonderful people I ever met was Desmond Tutu. How this came about was that I traveled to Cairo in 1994 to the AU meeting as a member of the ECOWAS delegation on the Liberian Civil War. And he then came to Monrovia unexpectedly. And the day that he arrived, as we met at the presidential palace, he was the first person to say to me, young man, didn't I see you in Cairo? He was that kind of person. He would always do something that would make you surprised. He was a normal human being. And interestingly, when I was introduced to him as being a Nigerian, once I said to him that I was actually from Jamaica, we got struck up his conversation. And he told me how he loved Bob Marley's music. That was my experience with him. He was a very normal human being. Well, uh, Lindsay, thank you very much indeed for sharing that with us. I mean, in the, in the context of what has happened, that's a very special memory you've got there. And let me come to you, Ambassador Humphrey Odiako. Thank you very much indeed for uh, staying with us. You are, of course, uh, an ambassador, a diplomat of uh, you know, enormous repute, met lots and lots of people. Um, I wonder what your reflections are about Desmond Tutu and what he meant to you. Uh, thanks, Charles, for bring me, bringing me into this conversation. You know, uh, everyone whose name rings a bell in the international community has had his voice raised and heard about Desmond Tutu. What else can little people like me add? Uh, when we've heard from the Queen of England, the Pope of the Catholic Church in Rome, uh, presidents uh, from the United States and across the world, it simply says something. And I had the opportunity to see, to meet this personally once in, uh, in, in Johannesburg, when I listened to uh, Archbishop Desmond to, to speak live, you saw this man who was a moral, a living moral authority. 
and he delivered morality with a lot of passion. And that passion was often couched in humor. That is true. In very funny language. Mm. You, you didn't know whether to laugh or to cry at the tragedy Bishop Tutu was describing. But then for me, the lesson wasn't South Africa specific, as uh, many people tend to think. It transcended all of Africa mm. and far beyond the world because the, the kind of uh, moral authority he bore, its influence should have been the moral compass for politics and politicians across this continent. Unfortunately, I do not think that that has held mm. in our own uh, practice of politics and in our own expectations of freedom and performances in government in Africa. That is the first thing that strikes me. Mm. Why and did we miss the influence on our social political lives of a man like Desmond Tutu? And that's a question that I think will linger for quite some time because that's a crucial question. And coming back to you, uh, Lindsay, um, Ambassador Giacco mentioned there that his influence stretched beyond South Africa and went pretty much across the continent. Um, what about beyond that? I mean, the, the, the diaspora, for example. I mean, how was he regarded in places where you originally come from, um, Jamaica, the Caribbean, and all the rest of it? Well, the most remarkable thing about the Archbishop was that his moral strength was not something he boasted about. It was others who understood it. And he was a, a guiding light. He, the fact that he became the head of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is a very important part of history because he was able to set the standard for genuine reconciliation, genuine um, love of humanity. And that is something we all have to learn from his example. Absolutely. And uh, I think we've got about a minute and a half or so before we have to take a break, um, Ambassador. But um, before apartheid ended, he was incredibly critical of the government in South Africa at the time. I mean, he urged countries around the world to impose sanctions on South Africa. And he was, of course, arrested several times. Do you get the sense that he was ever afraid for his own safety? Uh I think that um, Archbishop Tutu knew the meaning of fear in his uh, physical form. Uh, his, uh, his courage, his fearlessness uh, was obviously something that was inspired by the God he served. Mm. Because I do, in the, a man who could stand bef before the, the most feared tyrant of the time, Peter Botha, and actually make him to, to step back, to take a step backwards uh, from everything I've heard and read. That was the first time anyone, white or black, ever stood before Bota and forced him, compelled him to take a step backwards. Mm. I think that was in the, in the, in the sentencing of the Soweto, the, the, the Soweto convicts, you know, where Death sentences were obviously had to be committed to, to, to long-term sentence, and that was a death one to two. That kind of courage must be something that is <coughs> heaven-inspired. Yes, that's a very good point. And on that note, we'll take a break, but we will come back imminently. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our remembrance uh, of the life of the anti-apartheid leader Archbishop Desmond Tutu who's died at the age of 90. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I'm Charles Anyagolu. Now leaders from around the world have been paying tributes to Desmond Tutu, one of the heroes of the anti-apartheid movement who's died at the age of 90. Queen Elizabeth said she was deeply saddened by the loss of a tireless champion for human rights. Barack Obama described the late Archbishop of Cape Town as a mentor, friend and moral compass. In person, Archbishop Tutu was intensely warm and charming, yet he was uncompromising when facing up to what he thought was evil, openly comparing apartheid to Nazism, which wasn't a safe thing to do under white rule. And yet, he wasn't very enthusiastic about South Africa's ANC government either, condemning its growing corruption, even when his close friend, Nelson Mandela, was the ANC's leader. So he spoke against all those in power in South Africa who uh, abused their power. He, he, he wasn't a one... He was the rainbow leader. He didn't stick with one group. And he defended the rights of LGBT people in the Constitution. Uh, he defended the rights of uh, former enemies. He saw everyone as having that potential human dignity if they turned. And that is the legacy that goes around the world. Can we be a group that says it's not a zero-sum game? Can we be a humanity that says my gain need not be your loss. Your gain need not be my loss. We can both flourish and grow. And that is, I think, the greatest part of Tutu's legacy for the world. Justin Welby, and with me in the studio, Ambassador Humphrey Ojiako, Nigeria's former permanent representative at the United Nations, and on the line, the international journalist and African affairs analyst, Lindsay Barrett. Uh, thank you very much indeed for staying with us. So let me come to you, Lindsay, because he was obviously a priest, but do you think he could also be described as a politician or certainly a figure that acted politically? Well, he was definitely a major element in the politics of Africa. In the politics of South Africa, as I said before, he even took a role in helping to find peace in West Africa. He was definitely a figure in the role, but he himself said that you should never consider him a politician, that the Bible was his document. He was not working from a constitution or a political agenda or manifesto, but from the Bible. And he believed in the good of every human being, that you could find good in everyone, including those who had been most evil during the period of apartheid. So it's what we hope that the future will learn from the past that he has given us. Yes, uh, th those are good words of, of wisdom there. And uh, Ambassador Jekyll, Archbishop Tutu, was criticized by some, wasn't he, for being too interventionist, uh, as we mentioned there or hinted, a politician in a sort of clerical collar. But he said God's writ runs through everything, which is the point that... Um, Lindsay was making, and that includes politics. And as time went on, he became disillusioned with the ANC and the corruption and policy failures associated with many of its leading figures, wasn't he? Indeed, Charles. You know, for some of us who have this um, kind of disappointment at the men of color, the, the preacher men, the mm the church people, the imams, the religious um, clerics um, across Africa, Nigeria in particular. Um, I, each time I listen to a single voice, each time I read him, I see an aspirational Desmond Tutu in Bishop Matu 
cooker mm. of that, that, that's a very interesting yes very interesting catholic, analogy yes that catholic diocese of uh, very interesting of sokoto this is a man who as lindsay has said uses the bible which the which is the comprehensive word and comprehensive thought of mm. god to bring home to us that religion is not just about uh, the, the morality of politics. It's not just about uh, what has become monetization of the faith. Mm. Uh, it's also about the responsibility that those who bring themselves out to rule, to govern, those who are politicians, those who are in positions of authority, the elites in every professional aspect of life, owe to the society they serve. Mm. That is the message of Desmond Tutu. And I see that reflected often in the, in the, in the preachings of uh, Bishop Matthew That's Kuka. a very yes. interesting point you make. In fact, those are people who are called liberation theologians. theologians. They're, they're sort of, they're, their sure. motto is almost, thy will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Mm -hmm. And I in every aspect of life that you would have the presence of God in it. And, and that's one of the things that drives them to become very, quite political. So in very fact, I'm not even surprised mm. when I listen to the cooker himself on TV today, he, uh, he acknowledged that he had attended some college course mm. with uh, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu somewhere in England. Mm. So I said, maybe there's a... He, he rubbed off on him. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I wouldn't be surprised. But either way, I, I would certainly agree with you that a lot of people yeah. would argue that um, Bishop Kuka is the equivalent in Nigeria of a Desmond Tutu in South Africa. Sure. Um, but let me come to you, uh, Lindsay Barrett. He was, of course, staunchly against violence. Some saw, said that violence might be or would be necessary to bring about an end to apartheid. Do you think he was, in some sense, too soft on the apartheid regime? Because he eschewed violence? No, Charles, at no point was he soft on apartheid. He always stood firm on the basic principle of equity. And he felt that the fact that the apartheid regime did not believe in equity at all made it an evil force. You know, you made the point that he was the one who compared apartheid to Nazism and stood firm. And he, he lost fear very early in his career. And so I would say he, he gave us a challenge to always stand firm and be courageous, even though he was against violence as an instrument. He thought that the fight against the violence of the state was something that we should never give up. Yes, and uh, Ambassador Ojeko, I understand that beyond, as you, you called him the South Africa's moral compass earlier, he was also been described as, you know, the voice of reason. Um, but beyond all that, and, you know, the fact that he was seen as the face of reconciliation, I mean, it was Archbishop Tutu, and most people don't know this, who coined the phrase Rainbow Nation to describe South Africa's ethnic diversity. Yeah. And that's something that will live forever, basically. Indeed, it? indeed. The, the, um, the difference between uh, ordinary people like us and um, uh, global icons, morality icons like uh, Desmond Tutu, is that somehow they live forever, mm. even when they are dead. They live in the memories of men. They live in the encyclopedias. They live in all the artworks we have, we, mankind leaves behind when, mm. we, when we go. So I in his case, it is um, extraordinary that a man so diminutive in stature 
commanded such a huge personality in a society that had no regard whatsoever for any person of color mm. or any so his his authority uh, i have a feeling was uh, something that actually came as i said for from the god he mm. served because that kind of courage <coughs> that kind of uh, moral authority does not come to us easily who can be easily blackmailed mm. um, it's, it's it's really uh, something to be proud of that an African existed at the time Desmond Tutu did and accomplished so much in the midst of the most difficult odds. Mm. And they call people like that Christ figures. Not, so, not Jesus Christ, Indeed. but Christ figures, messianic figures sure. who, if you look through history, yes. they manifest themselves in different places where there's their challenges and problems sure. and, and so on and, and so forth and difficulties. Um, did you know that he was the person who came up with the term Rainbow Nation? Lindsay? Yes, I knew that, Charles. And um, remarkably, he saw the Rainbow Nation before it became the Rainbow Nation. At the time that the, the, the signal was given for, for us to decide what post-apartheid South Africa was going to look like. No one expected it. But when he brought it out, it was as if the entire country accepted it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, no, that, that's a good point. And let me, let me just come back to the man himself, because I think, Ambassador, you, you made a very interesting point. Um, how much time have I got? Okay. You made a very interesting point. Um, I think what struck me personally about him, I mean, I, I never had the opportunity to meet him, um, but just watching him and listening to him was the passion in, in his voice, but also, as you said, that infectious laugh that he had. Uh, I always had the impression of a man who was prepared to stand up politically um, for a cause he believed in, but also had a real impish sense of humor. Um, and, and, and you saw all this, but you also knew that he was one of the truly great men of history, possibly the greatest South African after Nelson Mandela. Well, in, in the realm of their existence, mm. it is difficult for us to measure which one was greater than the other. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually want to say that. Because, yes, uh, President Nelson Mandela mm. was iconic in the sense of his courage, his endurance, his longevity as a man of conviction and persuasion. Mm. In 27 years in prison, with so many offers to get, get freedom for himself, he preferred freedom for the whole mm. than freedom for himself. In his realm, that's not so possible. Mm. But in, in the realm of looking for justice, preaching for equity, for equality, the, the, the the, the so-called thinness and ethos of what we call democracy. I don't see the voice that could match Desmond Tutu's. Okay, that's a good point to, to stop with you. And let me give the final word to you, Lindsay Barrett. If we can end on a reflective question, we've got about 30 seconds. What do you think Desmond Tutu's political legacy is in South Africa? 20 seconds. Well, well, we are all hoping that his legacy will become the standard on which a basis for the democratic future of South Africa and all of Africa may stand. But it can only stand if there is a conversion from selfishness. Lindsay, thank you very much indeed. Lindsay Barrett and of course Ambassador Humphrey Ojeko, always grateful to you.